Hello everyone, I am Ahmed Magdi, lecturer of nephrology at Mansoura Faculty of Medicine and my topic will be the acute kidney injury challenge. It is one of the most important topics in the nephrology curriculum and we will try to cover it from bench to bedside. My agenda today will be targeted to some points. Number one, the important terminologies and the classifications of acute kidney injury. The how to evaluate the patient. We have an old traditional paradigm and a new, a new practical paradigm. All these points will be covered throughout this presentation. So if we start with the terminology, we have Number one, the issue of is it acute renal failure? Is it acute kidney injury? What's the difference between acute renal failure and acute kidney injury? The acute kidney injury refers to abrupt decrease in kidney function resulting in retention of urea and other nitrogenous waste products and dysregulation of extracellular volume and electrolytes. And this term replaces the old term acute renal failure. Why? Because this is a consensus now that smaller decrement in kidney function don't that don't result in overt organ failure are of, of substantial clinical relevance and are associated with increased morbidity and mortality. We have several consensus definitions of EKI developed in order to provide uniform definition. These definitions are based exclusively upon the serum creatinine, urine output, and are used primarily to identify patients with EKI in epidemiologic and outcome studies. We have other term, uh, other famous term, the uremia. Uremia is a constellation of signs and symptoms seen in either severe AKI or end-stage chronic kidney disease and presented by nausea, vomiting, androxia, fatigue, lethargy, confusion, and all these symptoms are due to uh, irritation of the uh, membranes or the mucous membranes and the endothelia with the uremic toxins. And we have azotemia. Azotemia is the lab finding of elevated serum urea and pre-renal azotemia and elevation of serum urea in absence of an elevation in serum creatinine that's specifically due to poor renal perfusion. Let's pass to the second objective of the agenda, the classification of acute kidney injury. Basically, the definition of classifying is categorizing something or someone, someone into certain group or system based on certain characteristics. And the classified informations are good for the clinical practice. Why? Because the patients in one group or under same classification have nearly the same clinical presentation, prognosis, treatment, and follow-up plans. So the classification is to guide the management. The classification is to guide the frequency of visits of the patient. How can I investigate the patients? What will I order for him from investigations? Uh, how many times I will see him? And also the prognosis. So each category, each stage carry the same plan of management, the same plan of follow-up, plan of investigations, and nearly the same prognosis. This is the idea of any classification in medicine. Regarding the acute kidney injury, we have multiple classifications, known classifications, the rifle criteria, the Aiken criteria, acute kidney injury group, and the last one and the most updated one, the uh, Kidigo criteria and all these are uh, um, based on the measurement of uh, serum creatinine and urine output like this when we have the diagnostic criteria first they share some criteria and differ in uh, others here I put to you all the uh, uh, the classifications available. This one is rifle. Rifle is the, the um, uh, abbreviation of uh, R risk, I injury, F failure, L loss, and E end stage renal disease. And this it changed in the Akin and the Kidigo and the last Kidigo to only three stages: stage one, stage two, stage three. We'd like to know general knowledge about it. The, the Kidigo, the, the last, the latest one, define AKI as increasing serum creatinine more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours, or more than one half time 
of the baseline or reduction of your volume below 0.5 milli per kg per hour for six hours. The Kidigo criteria allow the correction of volume status and obstructive cause of AKI prior to classification before diagnosing and classifying AKI one should assess and optimize volume status and exclude obstruction is very important because as we mentioned that the criteria depending on the rise of serum creatine and the urine output if the problem in urine output is obstruction it's a post renal no urine output it's now a problem of retention not an urea one uh, of the important limitations of this classification problem, are not an aphrodisiac problem the aphrodisiac problem the relationship means that the between no the so volumetric filtration no rate which is okay. the real assessment of the filtration power of the kidney the main function of the kidney and the serum creatine which is a marker uh, and they found that the relationship between the creatine and GFR is not linear if we see here this is the uh, start of declining of GFR from the normal 120, 180, 60 and still if we, if we take 60 still the creatinine may measure normal you, we all know that the, uh, uh, the creatinine, the normal creatinine from 0.7 to 1.3 or 1.4 so until the GFR is 60 the creatinine may be non-raised at all and then start to deteriorate after this so 40 we have uh, on the 40 also 2.5 then 20 or oh, at 20 the creatinine is 8 and if we see at the later stages the deterioration of GFR from 20 to 5 slight slight increase in the creatinine so the relationship is not linear and this is one of the limitations of classifications let's pass to so we now we finished the classification and we finished the terminology we'd like to now uh, think about if I if I am facing a patient with kidney failure or acute kidney failure how can I think practically so we will change the paradigm from causes definitions uh, clinical presentations uh, investigations in unordered treatment in unordered to no I need an approach how can I evaluate the patient and then how can I manage him the evaluation it's very important to quickly establish the cause of AKI. In many cases, AKI is reversible if the underlying cause is quickly identified and addressed. And our approach to evaluation is based on our understanding of the major cause. Yes, so number one, we will take the cause, but not in the regular manner. The first task in the nephrologist when facing a patient with renal impairment is to know is it an acute renal impairment or chronic renal impairment. Why? Because the main difference between the acute kidney impairment and chronic kidney impairment that we are in acute kidney impairment have the a chance to reverse the condition to save the kidney totally but in the chronic kidney disease we just deteriorate uh, sorry we just stop the progression we don't have um, an option to regain all the kidney function so sure the difference and the management plan will differ between uh, both of them so we are searching in the kidney, acute kidney injury about a reversible cause of injury. If I can reverse the problem, I will save the kidneys for the patient. And this was, if we if are talking about the causes, this was the traditional paradigm. It's an anatomical scheme for thinking about the cause of acute kidney impairment, maybe pre-renal, post-renal, or intrinsic renal. And then pre-renal, the, um, the main idea is the hypovolemia or the diminished kidney perfusion, maybe due to hypovolemia or decreased cardiac output or decreased, which is called decreased effective circulatory volume. You know, the effective circulatory volume is a volume within the intravascular space because I may have those patients with congestive heart failure or liver failure. There is escape of the fluids from the intravascular space to the interstitium so the patient appears swollen due to edema and pulmonary edema or edema ascites in liver cell failure but effectively the effective circulatory volume which perfuses the organs which perfuses the kidney the brain the heart 
and the uh, uh, liver is defected. This is a decreased, decreased effective circulatory volume. And we have impaired renal autoregulation, like a problem in the afferent arteriole, non steroidal, or the efferent arteriose, ARPs, ACE inhibitors, cyclosporin. All these will impair the uh, uh, autoregulation of the kidney and they impair the afferent and the efferent arteriolar harmony of action. This is the perenal. We have the intrinsic renal and again classified anatomically to uh, glomerular, tubular, interstitial, and vascular disorders. And we have the post renal AKI, uh, which means that there is an obstruction in the way of the urine to the outside, maybe at the level of the bladder, the, at the level of the uh, uh, uterine pelvis obstruction, bladder, or the urethra. This is which is called the retention, not the anurea. And we can use this in this and this, this is the same paradigm by different uh, diagram, uh, but telling us the same uh, information. The problem of this paradigm that this traditional approach has thus been categorized the clinical etiology as pre-renal, intrinsic renal, or post-renal. However, diseases often cross this boundaries as an example prolonged perilinear azotemia can lead to intrinsic acute kidney acute tubular necrosis and the untreated urinary tract obstruction eventually cause fibrosis and atrophy of the obstructed kidneys so it's not that separated you should have different way of thinking number one if i am facing a patient with acute kidney impairment the epidemiological consideration is very important. We have relative frequency of AKI etiologies. I should know that most of the AKI patients, the, the cause will be acute tubular necrosis or pre-renal disease, just renal hypovolemia, or acute renal impairment superimposed on chronic kidney disease. And this is also mostly due to acute tubular necrosis or pre-renal disease. So if we see this, this is not the real uh, statistics or the we, we don't have statistics in egypt but this is uh, a statistic from a study uh, comparing the etiologies of acute kidney injury in a cohort of population within a single center and this center found that around 45 percent of the patients are due to acute tubular necrosis and 20 percent due to prerenal disease and the acute on top of chronic 13% mostly of acute tubular necrosis and prenatal disease, and the urinary obstruction is only 20, 10, uh, 10 and we have the specific causes that we are as a nephrologist uh, is struggling to know about it and struggling to treat and are aggressive to treat. The glomerular flights vasculitis only 4%, acute interstitial nephritis 2%, and the acid emboli 1%. So when treating the patient or when managing the patient, the common is common. We should know that the acute tubular necrosis, the pre-renal causes, and the acute on top of chronic are the most common causes of acute kidney injury. And this is how we shift our academic knowledge to a practical one. Okay, so if I think about, I have a patient who is acute kidney impairment or acute deterioration of kidney function. The usual that I will start with the history and the examination. I will take the history from the patient first and then try to examine him. This is the step one, history and examination. And step two should be targeted investigations. Why? Because I, I, I am taking the history to make a differential diagnosis. I am doing the examination to narrow this differential diagnosis and then pass to the investigation in a targeted manner. And we have the specific urinary indices, ultrasound, the sediment, and the renal biopsy. I will not discuss this old diagram now, but it's a very important uh, picture telling you that I have steps and I should follow the steps to reach the diagnosis in a very simple way, in a very short way, and very effective way, and a very less costly way. And this is what any health uh, um, uh, system need a doctor like that. So what are important in history? What are the important points I should concentrate uh, in history? For all patients, 
we carefully review the history and particularly the timing of onset of EKI. So the first question to patient, the timing of onset. So I may have a patient who is referred to as high serum creatinine, accidentally discovered, or a patient who is diminished during volume. So diminished during volume, I can ask the patient easily, but the patient who is referred to as elevated serum creatinine or deteriorated kidney function may be asymptomatic, just accidentally discovered. So if I have the opportunity to know the timing of the onset, it will help me a lot. It will help me to differentiate between the acute kidney disease and the chronic kidney disease and help me in testing the uh, uh, um, proper etiology of the acute kidney injury. The timing of onset often suggests the underlying etiology. The date of onset can vary often by precisely timed if the serum creatinine concentration has been measured frequently as a part of routine blood testing of there is an accurate documentation of the urine output. So I may discover a patient referred to me with acute kidney injury or a patient admitted to the hospital due to any other cause rather than the acute kidney injury and they develop acute kidney injury within the hospital. And in the hospital, I have the records of the creatinine and I have the records of urine output, but I should be primed. I should know that all the critically ill patients may have the risk of developing acute kidney injury and subsequently i should be eager to know or to follow up his serum creatinine and his fluid balance and his urine output as an example suppose that a patient has a subtle creatinine concentration a stable sorry a stable serum creatinine concentration which is then begin to rise progressively on hospital day five Careful study of the patient's chart may identify the precipitating event on day three or four, like hypotension, radio contrast, exposure, or identify cumulative results prior to increase in serum creatinine. A careful, a very important point in the history, a careful review of the medication, medications, and the nephrotoxic medications is very, very important. Long standing medications like ACE and ARBs which make the patient more vulnerable to AKI from prenatal factor. And I will discuss this point in detail in the next slide because a very important cause of acute kidney injury, especially in our locality. Patient with certain underlying disease such as malignancy, because the malignancy may have an extra malignancy manifestations on the form of the kidney, maybe gonomenephritis, maybe uh, uh, deteriorated patient condition, deteriorated patient uh, uh, nutrition state, volume state, uh, which affect the kidney, are uh, uh, prone to specific kidney injury, and their evaluation may be tailored accordingly. And this is how the drugs cause acute kidney injury. As a simple presentation, the drugs can make the acute kidney injury, but by all the possible mechanisms. It can be prerenal, intrarenal or postrenal and here are the examples the most important are the diuretics which cause dehydration altered intrarenal autoregulation as we mentioned in the next in the, in the first slides the ACE ARBs you know that the ACE and ARBs affecting the efferent arteriole causing efferent arterial vasodilatation and this will drop the intraglomerular pressure and this drop will decrease the GFR Renal, intrarenal, ATN, aminoglycosides, cisplatin, tenover, acute interstitial nephritis, all the drugs can make by idiosyncratic mechanism acute interstitial nephritis, but we have uh, uh, certain famous drugs, the non anti-inflammatory, the proton bomb inhibitors, the beta-lactam, the vancomycin, and we have also the crystallization, crystal nephropathy within the renal tubules, acyclovir, gancyclovir, ciprofloxacin, sulfamisoxazole. And in the post-renal mechanism, yes, we have some drugs that decrease the bladder sensation and then build the trusal contraction and increase urinary sphincteric tone, like the opiate, the symbasomimetics, any anticholinergic uh, drug. So by all the mechanisms, the drugs can affect the kidney. And another very important issue I'd like to highlight when taking the history of the patient, if we have, if we have multiple risk factors for acute kidney injury, it can aggregate 
and they increase the possibility of injury. So the risk factor for developing drug-induced nephrotoxicity is the exposure to multiple nephrotoxins at the same time, or a patient with pre-existing renal insufficiency, or any cause of intravascular volume depletion plus the drugs, like the, the, uh, an old geriatric patient neglected in home, don't take the nutrition orally, don't take the possible fluids, have an attack of diarrhea for a one week or two weeks, so this will augment the injury of his diuretic therapy and will augment the injury of uh, his angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors if he uh, is taking this for the antihypertension. The advanced age, sepsis, the sepsis is a case of capillary leak, so the, the effective in, uh, intravascular volume increase, uh, decrease. The diabetes, all these are risk factors for uh, drug intoxication at the level of the kidney. So, this is a very important point to ask in the history. Let's pass to the important clinical examination items. Sure, the first target clinical examination is to adjust or assess for the volume status. If this patient is dehydrated, aovolemic or hypervolemic, this is a very important. Again, why? Because all the pre-renal causes and the acute tubular necrosis or the tubular injury from the dehydration come from volume contracted patient. So I should know how to assess the volume state of the patient. And I have multiple clinical parameters starting from the uh, uh, vital signs, the blood pressure, the pulse, the edema lower limb, the lower chest crackles, the skin turgor, the mucous membrane dryness, the GVB, jugular venous pressure, all these are signs to uh, assess the volume status of the patient. Another important is the drug rash or hypersensitivity, which is just the acute interstitial nephritis. We have uh, the kidney is one of the uh, organs which is consistent of multiple small vessels. This, those glomeruli are small vessels. So if I have a disease which affects the small vessels all over the body, like the small vessel vasculitis, I should search for other manifestations of small vessel affection. What are the sites of small vessels in our body? The sites are the uh, skin, the joints, the GIT, the pulmonary alveoli, so fever, skin rash, livido reticularis, sinusitis, arthritis, and pulmonary symptoms as indicated for small vessel vasculitis. Significant volume overload and signs of heart failure suggest cardiorenal syndrome. Ascites and jones suggest liver disease with portal hypertension and hepatorenal syndrome. So this is the approach. What are the targeted points? What are the most important points which help me to differentiate between the causes of the acute kidney kidney injury? And then pass to the investigations. Now this is the step number three, the targeted investigations. We have targeted investigations. If we look to this diagram, we will read it. So any, any patient, I should start from the urine analysis. Why the urine analysis? Because the urine analysis, it is called the mirror of the kidney. Because the urine is the product of the kidney and will pass through all the urinary tract. So any injured structure, will be presented in the urine in the form of maybe cells, maybe casts, maybe uh, crystals. So uh, uh, the, um, the urine is the first priority in the uh, uh, examination of patient with AKI. So if I found the urine, is there abnormal proteinuria or hematuria? Yes. So this called an active urinary sediments and this is one of the evidences that the problem is at the level of the glomeruli but again not any proteinuria and hematuria we have criteria for the glomerular hematuria and the glomerular proteinuria the glomerular proteinuria is usually significant amount and the glomerular hematuria is a dysmorphic heart disease in urine so I should evaluate for glomerulonephritis, and they will evaluate by 
the serological test and the renal biopsy. If no, okay, I will search for sterile pyuria maybe or pyuria. I should, if I have pyuria, white blood cells. White blood cells means inflammation. And this inflammation can be caused by infection or non-infectious agent. What's the most important inflammation is the interstitial nephrites, acute interstitial nephrites. But if there is biuria due to infection, it will appear in the urine culture. I will find the organism and find the sensitive antibiotic to it. Okay. If there is any pigmented granular cast or renal tubular epithelial cells, if yes, it means that there is a tubular injury because those are the cells of the tubules. So if I have pigmented granular casts or renal tubular cells, it's an acute tubular necrosis. If no, again, I will come back to the history and physical, examina physical examination, such as sepsis, shock, hypotension. Uh, uh, and then if all these are excluded, I will pass to the ultrasound. The ultrasound show obstruction or not? So yes, at this obstruction, no. I have many other causes. I will search for the rest. I will telling you the rest of the diagram within the next slides. Okay. So if I try to prepare, theoretically, I should differentiate the patient be of pre-renal AKI and acute tuberculosis necro necrosis. But I, I am intended to not make this point in this diagram because this point have multiple limitations. The highest yield of the diagnosis or the investigations of the acute kidney injury is the urine dipstick and the analysis and the ultrasound of, the, of both kidneys. This is what the studies told us that the most important and the highest yield of, of diagnosis are from those two and then the serology and renal biopsy so this is number one i will discuss it but we should know that it's not practical 100 percent of why because it have multiple limitation this is the most practical one and i will tell you why and this is the serology and renal start from step number one how to differentiate between the pre-renal aki and acute tubular necros we have which is called the fraction excretion of sodium. We'd like to know how much the kidney is secreting sodium or, or urea. Why? Because that in, in pre-renal condition, the kidneys think rightly or wrongly that the patient is dehydrated. In any pre-renal condition, the, the kidney think rightly if the cause is volume depletion or wrongly if the cause is uh, related to the vessels or related to the defective uh, circulatory volume. Therefore, they try to hold the sodium. So the fraction excretion of sodium will be so low. But in acute tubular necrosis, the kidney tubules are damaged. So the kidney will not or will not be able to concentrate the urine. So the fraction excretion of sodium is high. So as an interpretation, if I found the fraction excretion of sodium is below 1%, this is suggest pre-renal etiolis. And this, it's, if, it, if it is above 2 percent it, su it, uh, it suggests acute tubular necrosis but why it's not accurate why because this is not accurate in mild aki and not accurate in aki on top of significant ckd or if the patient taking recent diuretic dose because the diur diuresis is through the loss of sodium and water to into the renal tubules so i have here some factor this is why i am we are not relying on this but it can be it can be helpful start with the high steel the urine dipstick and the urine analysis and the urine microscope and this is a very very nice presentation of what are the expected it changes in the urine according to the pathology so if we have the decreased renal perfusion sure the urine will appear concentrated dark here and sure, the specific gravity, because the urine is concentrated, is high. I can found protein or not. Sure, no white blood cells, no nitrites, no RPCs, no, no, no white blood cells, maybe healing costs. 
So this hyaline cause or specific uh, uh, or protein may be due to tubular uh, uh, response. The acute tubular necrosis, no. There is loss of the concentrating ability of the urine. So the specific gra gravity will decrease. I may found any type of abnormal cell in the urine, but with a mild amount. In acute interstitial nephritis, I should have white blood cell casts, but in the severe cases only, not all the cases. But I can be faced with white blood cells, as I mentioned before in the diagram, in the approach, the presence of white blood cells in urine doesn't necessitate it is an a bacterial infection no it's an, a sign of inflammation this inflammation can be infectious or non-infectious so the acute interstitial phase and uti may be in nephrotic and the nephritic syndrome those are pure clinical presentations so the nephrotic syndrome is presentation of foamy, foamy urine severe elevated protein fatty costs in the nephritic, I should have dysmorphic RBCs and the RBCs cast. Those are the diagnostic criteria of the uh, uh, nephritic syndrome. And this is how the urine diabetic analysis and the microscopy can help us in the differentiation of causes of acute. If we see the normal kidneys here, we don't see the renal pelvis this much. The renal pelvis that contain this dark. Uh, 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 black color, dark black color mean fluid. Okay, we can see here a dilatation in the calices, uh, pelvis and calices are hypoechoic, uh, hypo dilated, and this expect a urethral obstruction. This is the importance of renal biopsy is to know the end stage of these cases and the hydronephrosis. And number four, the serology and renal biopsy. Is any patient presented with AKI should need to do a renal biopsy? We should know that. The renal biopsy is an invasive maneuver and they carry some risks to patient. So I should have the justification to do to do the renal biopsy of the patients. To two patients. It's not a routine workup. Okay, and if and this is the importance why I tell you at the first, I should know the epidemiological frequency of causes of acute kidney injury. I should pick the only four or ten percent who will benefit from the renal biopsy. And if I if I did the renal biopsy, if I do to the renal biopsy to all the patients, I will expose them to risk with no benefit. So the risk benefit balance is very important in choosing the patient with renal biopsy. I'll do the renal biopsy to the patient when I expect that the renal biopsy finding will change the treatment plan. The patient may have a specific cause with specific treatment should be justified by the renal biopsy. And if I'd like to know the prognosis of the patient. So the renal biopsy is reserved to the unexplained AKI the acute tubular necrosis, not the, not the pre renal, the acute tubular necrosis AKI, which we know that the natural history of the disease that the tubules will recur within three to four weeks. So if the patient, if the patient not improve by the three or four weeks, I can do the renal biopsy for prognostic significance. The rapidly progressive AKI, because the, the rapidly progressive AKI non controllable may indicate a glomerular inflammation and the glomerular pathology which need a specific treatment the dialysis dependent AKI the AKI and systemic disease as I mentioned the systemic vasculites if I see a kidney injury with pulmonary injury and GIT injury and skin rashes and arthritis it may be a small vessel vasculites and this small vessel vasculites may indicate a specific treatment the aggressive immune suppressive treatment but please please don't forget the risk of bleeding in patient with thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy. So we should investigate by serology and renal biopsy those who are at risk of uh, uh, deteriorating kidney function and who 
is supposed to have a specific treatment for their acute kidney. I will not uh, repeat the uh, this diagram again. This is a simple sample uh, of the uh, practical approaches uh, which divide the causes according to the history and examination, and then the ultrasound, the urine and electrolytes. How can I differentiate between post renal, pre renal? Uh, tubules, interstitial, vas uh, vascular injuries. This is a repeated one. Uh, just leave it for you to uh, read it. Then, pass to the last section of the lecture. What are the target of management? The problem of the acute kidney injury carry uh, very hazardous consequences and complication. Short term and long term. We have short-term in hospital mortality and increase the length of stay in the hospital and long-term mortality or current kidney disease or anesthesia and disease. All these are very exhausting disease uh, complications to the patient and to the health system. So the prevention is the gold standard or the first idea in management of any acute kidney injury. Prevention, so you would ask me, how can I prevent? I prevent the high risk group. As I told you, the high-risk group, the diabetics, the chronic hypertensive, the chronic diabetics, the patients with persistent urinary tract infection, the patients with persistent urinary tract obstruction, all those are, are of high risk and those should avoid any dehydration, any sepsis, any nephrotoxic medication, any decreased renal perfusion, any radiocontrast agent, or any cardiopulmonary bypass. Why? because all these patients are prone to injury and this will affect my management. I should health educate them about these risk factors and if I have a patient admitted with any other cause but have those risk factors, I should follow up the patient or the creatinine, the urine output, I should follow up the renal functions very well because I know that the patient may pass to uh, acute kidney injury. So when managing the patient, I should know, number one, the severity. And this is the first importance of the classification. In general, the complications associated with AKI are more severe and life-threatening with higher stages of AKI. However, all patients with AKI are at risk for complication and for possibility of milder AKI progressing to more severe AKI. So the initial steps of the urgent management depend upon whether the patient is in hospital or in the outpatient setting. Okay, so I may have a patient presented with acute kidney injury, but I don't have just conserve the patient with the general medicine or refer it to nephrology or refer it to ICU. I should have a triage, triage which stratify the patients according to the what what's emergent, what's urgent. Triage of outpatients with acute kidney injury. In the outpatient setting, the initial evaluation of patient with AKI is directed at triaging the patient to the appropriate setting, such as the emergency department for more severe disease or life-threatening electrolyte abnormalities. I should break those. The very important or the very dangerous problem of the acute kidney injury that it may affect the electrolytes and the acid base status and the volume state. And we know that some electrolytes have a very uh, uh, hazardous effect on the heart rhythm and the, in the heart conduction. So it may convert to life threatening. So identifying patients for emergency and renal department referral, any patient with stage two or three AKI, or any patient with stage one, but have an unclear etiology, uh, or patient who have unknown duration or trajectory of elevated creatinine. We don't have history about the patient serum creatinine. Uh, or if there is concern that the condition may not be rapidly reversible with simple interventions. Because the simple intervention of the acute kidney injury it may be due to pre-renal. I just I will hydrate the patient and make a fluid trial and uh, wait for the response. If I don't know a potential nephrotoxin or a potential uh, hypovolemia, I, which I can correct it easily by just holding the, the nephrotoxic agent and hydrate the patient, I should refer the patient to a specialist. 
Patient with stage one should be referred to the emergency if they have a concomitant or uncontrolled comorbid condition like acute on top of chronic exacerbation of heart failure or diabetic ketoacidosis. Patients with AKI at any stage seen in the resource limited outpatient setting where the initial diagnostic evaluation like the renal ultrasound is not available or intervention like the intravenous fluid administration require an emergency department referral. So you should judge the situation. You should, you should judge the area you are serving in. If it's not uh, um, equipped with ultrasound, not equipped with uh, 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 possibility to uh, monitor the patient fluid status and give the patient IV fluids and reassess again, you should refer the patient for feeling of progression of acute kidney injury to the progressive. And the question number two. If I have a patient with acute kidney injury, do I have to dialyze him urgently? We have certain criteria for doing this. So if the patient have a pulmonary edema and respiratory failure from the volume excess, I don't have the time to uh, 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 try diuretics or try fluid challenge or something like that. A patient with a patient with hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia associated with cardiac conduction abnormalities or hyperkalemia, if there is an expected cause that will increase the hyperkalemia, like the, the ongoing tissue breakdown, rhabdomyolysis, because the, 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 the cells will uh, rupture and liberating potassium, or ongoing potassium absorption, like significant gastrointestinal bleeding. Signs of uncontrollable uremia, like the uremic encephalopathy, uremic pericarditis, severe metabolic acidosis, unless acidosis can rapidly uh, resolve it by quickly correcting the underlying etiology like the diabetic ketoacidosis and the acute poisoning. Those are the indications of urgent renal replacement therapy. Then pass to the subsequent management. So at first we categorize the patient, know how urgent the patient is, know who, which patient will be dealt in the emergency, and then the first is the uh, 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 evaluation of the patient, how emergent the patient is, and then pass to the subsequent management. The subsequent management. Treating reversible causes such as hypotension, volume depletion, or tract obstruction, removing any active insult to minimize the new injury, or identifying and treating the complications that may eventually require renal replacement therapy at a later period. If AKI doesn't resolve, like electrolyte and uric acid uh, uric, uh, and acid-based disturbance. We will concentrate on two issues, the volume status and diuretics and fluids. Volume status assessment. In the acute kidney injury patient, we may have all the possible presentation. Maybe the, the patient may be presented by hypovolemia due to losses like gastrointestinal urinary blood or cell space losses or hypotension which may can be true or relative or drug-induced hypotension, or as a consequence of the acute kidney injury itself, the patient may be hypervolemic due to expansion of the extracellular fluid, and this result in the uh, uh, signs of hypervolemia, or may be hypovolemic in the recovery uh, phase of acute kidney injury in the polyuric phase. Uh, if not treated, it may lead to volume depletion. So the hypovolemic patients uh, in hypovolemic patients, intravenous fluid therapy should be administered to patients with a clinical history consistent with fluid loss, such as vomiting or diarrhea, and physical examination consistent with hypovolemia. However, fluid therapy should be avoided in patients with pulmonary edema or clear evidence of anuria. And we have goals for the resuscitation of this patient. We, ha we have a new paradigm that it's not only the patient's hypovolemic, it's the patient should be fluid responsive. Why the fluid? How, how can I judge this? Presumably, I give the patient IV fluids to increase the preload and increase the cardiac output, so maintain the tissue perfusion and maintain the kidney perfusion and reverse the acute kidney injury. Okay? Not all the patients who will take, who will take IV fluids will improve the cardiac output because some patients may have cardiac problems, okay, so the fluids will harm them. So I should know if the patient is fluid responsive or not. So I should do a trial of fluid and then test the cardiac output and administering the fluid to those who will benefit from 
fluids. The hypervolemic patients, I can use the diuretics. Diuretics may be used to relieve hypovolemia. I should give the chance to diuretics if the patient not in respiratory failure from pulmonary edema or life threatening condition. Okay, I should start uh, with uh, uh, um, try to, trying to uh, make a diuretic challenge to the patient and testing if the patient will uh, uh, um, increase their own output or not. And this is our, uh, those are the, uh, how can we do this? The doses, we, you can read it. Uh, I just put it for, for you as a reference, but lack of response to diuretic therapy may suggest the need to the dialysis or the extracorporeal removal of excess volume. And this is again the rule of renal replacement therapy. Patients who have anuria for more than 24 hours or fail to respond to diuretic, and patient with the urgent manifestation, as we mentioned be, uh, 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 before, in addition to relieving volume overload, renal replacement therapy may allow clinicians to optimize nutritional support and use of intravenous medication without concern of inducing volume overload. And this is a very important issue in treating the patient because. Because if I if I do, uh, if I put the patient on a diuretic therapy and still waiting if the patient will respond or not, I will restrict the fluids and restrict the IV fluids. However, the benefits of early initiation for volume management remain uncertain, despite an association between the severity of volume overload at renal replacement initiation and uh, mortality. At the end, I'd like to thank you. Uh, uh, for the concentration over the uh, the whole lecture, uh, you really concentrate to minute 45, so you are a hero. Uh, but I'd like again and again um, highlight the issue that we should think practically, we should think uh, critically. It's not just the academic knowledge; we should know what's behind the academic knowledge. And here is my email. Uh, I'll be very happy to accept any uh, questions and try to answer it um, as much as you can as I can. Uh, thank you again and goodbye.